And uh, I also know that it would be, would be a challenge to apply the usual star reduction or star de-emphasis techniques, because in addition to a large number of smaller stars, there are some big guys here. And those typically are bad customers for, uh, for star reduction and star de-emphasis. And so let's see what I did to, to fix those uh, two issues and obtain a, a nice image in the end. So, I'm switching now to a, a few slides. So I use the StarNet for both of those issues. And the StarNet is, a, is essentially an application of AI, artificial intelligence to astrophotography. This is a quote from the project page. StarNet++ is a neural network that can remove stars from images. Now, I'm not a, a machine learning guy, so I, I barely know what it means. Nicola can probably talk uh, much more than I than I can about this, but suffice to say that this is a, a program that has been around for two years, about two years. Initially, it was a standalone tool that you had to run from the command line. Few people were using it. Then it got integrated uh, in PixInsight and it arrived on the Mac about one year ago, thanks to Rob, who built uh, the the first uh, StarNet module inside PixInsight. And most recently, finally, the, the Play This Astro um, collaboration has included it in uh, PixInsight 1886. Okay, I got it. So, uh, what does a StarNet++ do? So, if, you, um, if you're not already familiar, it does this. It goes from here to here. How does it do that? Well, somebody taught this neural network how to, uh, how an image, what is the difference between an image with stars and an image without stars? And the, this neural network learned, and so can apply the same process to almost an image that you can throw at it. Uh, but the question is, okay, that's nice, but why would I want a starless image? Well, let's just start by saying that some people like it. Some people like to see only the nebulae behind the stars, not the stars themselves. I personally like to see both, but I like to be in control of the mix. I like to decide how much I see of the nebula and how much I see of the stars. Uh, and as I learned how to integrate uh, StarNet++ in my PixInsight workflow, I learned that there are cases in which uh, the starless version of an image is a very useful intermediate step. And I'm going to present here these two cases. The first one <clears throat> is uh, the correction of dust melts. So you just saw this image in my, in, from, uh, from my actual pixel site. How do we fix this? Now, you can use uh, some painting uh, process, like uh, the clone, uh, clone painting uh, in, um, in, in pixel site. But the problem is, uh, how do you do that without uh, going over the stars and by copying the background from another region. You can uh, mask the star, but creating a good uh, star mask is already a task. And also, uh, even, even when you put a star mask, if you copy clone from one region of to another, and the, the source region has stars, you're just gonna paint the stars onto the destination just by excluding the, the other stars. So this is how picked, um, StarNet Plus plus comes to the rescue. We can use a StarNet to prepare from this, from the image, a starless version. Then we can paint over the defect. And in this case, it's easy because the stars are not there. So you're, you can just find a, a region of the background, which is similar in, uh, in luminance to the one uh, that you, to where you have the defect and just clone over, maybe using some uh, not 100% uh, opacity so that you can graduate your, your effect. Then you add back the stars and you obtain the, the equivalent of the original uh, of the image that you started from, but without the defect that you just corrected. Uh, yes, easier said than done. Uh, the first problem is that StarNet++ only works on stretched images. But it would be awesome if this kind of correction could be done in the linear stage. Uh, because uh, it would uh, it would help us in the in the process. You don't have that big uh, 
uh, black dot uh, to to scroll up all your statistics. Okay, <clears throat> there's a solution for that. We can do a stretch, but a reversible stretch, so not an extreme one. Then we fix uh, the, the the defect, and then we reverse the stretch back to a linear image. How do we do that? Well, and the way I do it, I start with uh, by copying uh, the settings for an auto STF string transfer function into the histogram transformation tool, like uh, everybody does when you want to do an initial uh, initial stretch. But be very careful, tweak it so that you clip as little as possible. As you can see here, I'm clipping only 227 pixels out of uh, over 6 million, so um, probably still okay. And when, you have, when you're settled on uh, the right transformation, be sure to write down or copy from uh, the, the history window the, these two parameters, the shadows setting and the midtones settings, which are shown here in the window and here in the source code for the transformation. This will come handy later, because at this point, we just uh, apply all the corrections that we want, and then we the way I do it is by creating a, for first I use a starnet to create this, um, a starnet version and the difference between the original image, which I call temp here, and the starnet version. Then I clone the, the, the starnet version into a, a copy over which I'm going to paint. Why do I do that? Because of this, what I tried to highlight here in this, uh, in this chart. So the defect is essentially a depression in the baseline level of the background. The stars are not depressed in the same, by the same quantity, because if you think about it, the, the defect is present in some of the, only in some of the images, but the stars are present in all of the, the subs. And so the stars end up being almost uh, entirely as they would be without a defect, which means that if you just uh, correct the defect, so you fill up this uh, this this uh, trough, and then you add the stars as they were, those stars are going to be brighter than they were originally, brighter than they would be on, a, on, an, on an image without this defect. So the way I do it is uh, to recombine the two, the, the two images, the, the one that I painted over and the star difference using some pixel math that says, okay, add the two, but then uh, also add, uh, sorry, sub, add but in uh, alge algebraically, so it's going to be subtract the difference between what I painted and the original if, uh, if there's actually something there. If the level of the difference, i.e. the stars, are more than 0 0.02 in, uh, this is arbitrary, you can, you can do uh, by trial and error, you can find the, the value most suitable for you. And uh, finally, you reverse uh, this, the stretch transformation using this uh, um, pixel math expression, which I didn't invent. I found this on, a, I believe, in the PixInsight forum. Uh, and you can see this expression is being fed with uh, the shadows level and the midtones level that I noted down in the previous step here. Now, enough uh, with uh, this uh, talking, and I'm going to show you how it works in, uh, in PixInsight. So this is the, the image that I wanted. So I, I cloned it, and I cloned it in, into this, uh, this image here. Then I cloned again, and I stretched it, of course. I cloned again in, uh, into this uh, temp paint. Temp paint originally was like this. Then I used the, the let me show you in the history. I used the clone stamp tool to blot away. Francesco, I think we may only be seeing your main image. Oh, um, that's the problem. Okay, PixInsight is doing something okay. stupid. Uh, so you see the, uh, what is the name of the window that you can see? Clone stamp. Can you see, <laughs> okay. Can you see temp starnet clone? 
Yes. Okay. So I, if I go ahead in the history, you can see here, I copied over the defect. The defect is no longer there. I don't see the history. No, the history. Can you see the history now? No. Okay. For some reason, I picked the, the screen capture does only does not capture the modal dialogues. Okay. We, we, saw the, we don't see your mouse either. At least I don't see your mouse either. Okay. Yeah. There's something strange. Can you see my, my mouse here? No. No. Okay. Okay. No, never mind. We'll do without the mouse. Sorry. Okay. Now it's open. Can you see it? Now we see your uh, your PowerPoint. Your, uh, your oh, keynote. you're still with the PowerPoint. It just flashed back to it uh, like 15 seconds ago. Okay, there's something strange. Sorry. Back to the PowerPoint then. All right, so the uh, this is going to be a pain. It is right. See your Pix Insight though. So if you you know don't want to discourage you from that. Yeah, let me try to move a Pix Insight to the same uh, desktop. Can you see it now, Pix Insight? Yes. Let me try. Now I pulled out the history window. Can you see it? And I see. No, it's my cursor. No. Uh, we, now we see the history yes. window. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I wonder why I have to do it twice, but it's fine. So you see, now I, I went back one step in history. It was a, as the image was a, was first generated. I only changed the image identifier. When I apply the clone stamp process, it's basically me painting over the defect. Now it's questionable whether you should paint over an image. Of course, once you do it, you have uh, given up uh, any pretense of uh, this image being a, a, a faithful representation of the sky. There's no more science here. <laughs> this is. Uh, we enter the realm of the artistic interpretation. So I, I apologize uh, if, uh, if somebody doesn't agree. But anyway, once we have uh, obtained this, uh, uh, this image, what I do is uh, to go back uh, again in the history of uh, this image, which is the, the original one. And I apply this. Uh, Francesco, just to let you know, your mouse appeared. OK, good. And I apply this uh, pixel math expression. When I apply it, uh, let me zoom in a little bit. OK, so this is the defect. You see that there are stars in this in the trough represented by this, uh, by this dust mold. So if all I did was to add uh, what I painted and the stars. Look at what happens. The stars become brighter. <clears throat> we don't want that. So what I do is to use this expression. When applied, it gives a more fit, a more a representation of the stars in their brightness values, which is more is closer to what they were before my correction. So essentially, I corrected the, the trough represented by the, the dust mode without touching the stars, or almost without touching the stars. At this point, this, uh, this temp image is still uh, stretched. I have to reverse the stretching transformation to put it here. And I do it uh, directly onto the, this uh, integration image, the one, uh, the, my main one using a pixel math, using the same expression that I showed you. And when I do it, the dust mode is gone and the image is linear. And so I have uh, achieved the first, uh, the first result that I wanted, which is to do the correction still in the, while still in the linear stage. If you look at the, the histogram of this image, the histogram is all compressed towards the left. If I want to see something, I have to do an expansion, as you, and which this is the hallmark of a, of a linear image. If I go back and forth in history, undo and redo, you see the histogram does not change, which means that I'm not clipping any, anything important in this image. 
which is again one of the things that I wanted to achieve. My correction has not uh, has altered only the part of the image where I wanted to intervene and has left everything else unaltered. So that once I once I've done that, I can continue going through the history of this application. So I do automatic color calibration, and then uh, I do a TGV denoise, and then I'm ready to do the stretch. And again, as I said uh, earlier, if I just stretch this application, even if I use, a, of course, if I use a histogram transformation, but even if I use a arc signature transform, I end up in a situation in which many of the stars will become huge and desaturated in their color. So how do I avoid that? So the technique that, I'm, that I propose and I used for this image is the following. So my goal is to stretch the image so that in the end, I preserve the stars. I, I preserve good stars and I, and I don't end up with bloated and washed out stars. It would be so nice if we could stretch the nebula separately from the stars so that we do the best for each of the two aspects, the two sides of the image. Well, StarNet++ allows you to do exactly that. So what I'm proposing is to start uh, with a very gentle stretch. In this case, I'm using uh, ArcSynH that gives you, with the goal of giving you the stars that you like. Don't think of the nebula, focus on uh, having a, a presence of the stars that you will be comfortable with in the final image. So this is what uh, this, the initial stretch that I wanted. The nebula is almost invisible. But if when you apply StarNet++, you get one image with only the nebula and one image with only the stars, which is essentially the difference between this and this. At that point, you can process the starless version the way you like, optimizing the visibility of the nebula, and when you combine the starless and processed image with the, with the original star field, you're going to obtain an image in which the stars have the, the same level of presence that they had where you started, but the, the nebula is much more visible. Let me show you the effect in uh, if I switch to PixInsight. So now I switch to non, I deactivate the STF. This is the, <clears throat> my original image. What I did here is a simply an arc sin H stretch <clears throat> with a factor of 200, which is a very, let's say, conservative stretch. Then I do my magic uh, in a, on, a, on a clone of this, uh, of this image by applying StarNet. And I'm just gonna show you the final result here by going ahead in history. You see, it's quite a difference, quite dramatic. All right, how do I do that? Well, first of all, I start with uh, by cloning this image and applying the StarNet on it. And let me start. This is the clone. The next step in the history is a StarNet. This generates a starless version. At this point, I stretch. I, I stretch using uh, exponential transformation and the curves transformation, even history and transformation at some point because I want to fix the, the, the black point, etc. So do it to your heart's content. Uh, however, and there are some caveats. So StarNet++ seems to be very effective when used on a images that are stretched gently. But even when it works best, even in the ideal condition, it leaves behind some small artifacts that become visible when uh, the when the image, when the starless image gets stretched more and more. Those, those uh, artifacts are ugly. <clears throat> this is an example. So this is uh, the original uh, <clears throat> zoom in of the original uh, image. You can almost not, you can't see anything, but after stretching, you see these patterns here. These are artifacts left by, um, by StarNet++. The, 
this pattern has become much more visible because of the stretching. When I recombine this image with the stars, in a, if I hadn't stretched anything, they would just recombine. They would be one the mold of the where the other was taken from. But after the, the stretching done, this is this no longer happens. The two, the artifacts in the star ver in the starfield version and the starless version no longer cancel each other, and you have to do something to avoid that. And the way I do it is to create a star mask, which essentially Pixels, uh, Starnet already gave me. I just needed to binarize it and apply a little bit of um, uh, morphological transform to isolate only those artifacts because the artifacts are under the stars. And so if you create a mask that isolates the stars, you have effectively isolated the artifacts. And then I smooth them using a, a little bit of a MMT, multi-scale median transform, by reducing the detail of some of the of the layers. Keep in mind, this is only affect. This is only going to affect the regions where the stars were, where the artifacts are. It requires some trial and error, but in the end, you can smooth them out pretty good. You don't want them to be super smooth. You want them to have a, the same grain or graininess as the the rest of the image. At least that's what works for me. Once this is done. You can uh, recombine the two images, and the effect will be pretty, ple pretty, pretty pleasant. So let me go back to PixInsight and show you what I've done here. So the first thing I do is uh, an initial morphological transformation, and uh, it creates this kind of result. Still very, very gentle. The nebula starts to be visible, but it's not yet uh, uh, really clear. Then I do a more a curves transformation to make it more uh, more evident, and at that point I go and, and inspect the artifacts. Can you see the artifacts here? I don't know if uh, they are reproduced well yes. in uh, the Google Meet. Yes, we can. All right. Now I apply the morphological transformation, the multi-scale median transform. Sorry, that I showed you before in the slides, and they're gone. You see, I'm happy with this. I have a much smoother regions where the stars used to be, so I can continue stretching this image. Zoom out. First with a little bit of a histogram transformation, then another exponential transformation, then another histogram transformation, then maybe some local histogram equalization that makes the structure more visible. And, uh, and to finish it off with a masked exponential transformation and uh, a, a little fit in the black level. Now I'm happy with the result. And uh, I think I can go back and integrate uh, the starless version, which uh, I heavily processed, with the star field. Uh, generated by Starnet Plus, which I haven't touched at all. There's no, I didn't do any star reduction. Let me show you what the result. And this is the result. At this point, the only other adjustments that I did, I did some SNCR to remove uh, uh, green. I had, uh, my original image was rather green, so there's, it's possible that there's some green left behind. And then I saturate the stars and that's it. At this point, I have an image in which uh, the stars are nice and visible, but they are not overwhelming the nebula. Actually, maybe the nebula is overwhelming the stars. So, if uh, if a possible critique, uh, that would be that would be it. But there is something else that I want to talk to you, to you about, which is not that apparent in this uh, uh, in this image. So, let me go back to the slides. So, the final consideration is. Uh, whether we, this image is still a, a true representation with true in multiple, multiple quotes, or we have crossed over into artistic interpretation. So consider that when we sum the stretch, the starless image with the unprocessed star field, you end up with the stars riding on the nebula pedestal. Given that we have stretched the nebula pedestal, we, it's, it is no longer what it used to be. 
This means that the, the stars that happen to sit in the nebula end up being brighter than the stars that are just sitting on the background sky. We have effectively altered the brightness relationship among the stars. In, in theory, we could apply a technique similar to the one that I told you about when I corrected the dust modes. And I can go and, uh, and uh, subtract uh, the corrections that I did, uh, but um, that I did while, while stretching. But this creates another interesting problem. So uh, it, this would maybe restore the brightness relationship among stars, but it would completely alter the relationship between the nebulae and the stars that are circling close to them. So my the way I, I came to peace with this, uh, this problem is that uh, I believe that once we take the, the star net plus plus path, we leave the path of having a, a faithful representation of the brightness and the, their relationships. At that point, there is no right way. It boils down to what we want to represent with our image. If you want to represent just the just the nebula, you might as well use a, just a, purely a starless image maybe correcting the artifacts the way I showed you. What I like to do, I'm, I'm not at extreme. I, want, I still like to see some stars. And so I like to have, uh, in the end, uh, an image like this that still represents the stars. And uh, although it's true that the brightness relationship is no longer there, I can show you if you want, at least I have uh, some, uh, let's say, the the image still hints at uh, a relationship between the brightness of the nebula and the stars. It's not as extreme as it was. I corrected it to make it more visible. And I did it because I wanted to make the nebula accessible to the, to the viewer. And uh, I, I'm open to sacrificing a little bit uh, of the brightness, the correct brightness relationships uh, for that. I'm sure that if I posted this on the Pixinside forum, Juan Conejero will, uh, will lash at me because his philosophy is very different. But for what I, what I, my intent in this image is not to be scientific, but to show something that is there and uh, most of the times we don't see. Hmm. Let me show you what I meant uh, by br brightness relationships. So you see this, uh, look at these two stars here, the blue and the yellow one. When I apply the pixel method to recombine the starless version and the, the process starless version and the star field one, the stars become brighter because they are now they are riding over a, a nebula which is much brighter. Mm -hmm. But yeah, my inter, in my this matches my intention. It doesn't match the the true physical reality of that. And uh, I'm okay with that. Are there any questions? Well, I very much like the effect also, so. Uh, What's that? I very much like the, the way that it turned out. So I think that- Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I use the same technique uh, for uh, this other image that I processed uh, um, two days ago. Not this one, well, this one too, but in particular this one, the the Fleming Star Nebula and the tadpoles that are uh, I image with five hours of exposure. As you know, Origa is a very dense star field. It is, uh, I can open the Pix Inside project here, you're going to see. When I saw this image, I'm, I, I said to myself, I'm never going to be able to bring this nebula out without the stars uh, using up 30% uh, of, the, of the screen or the state. But in the end, using StarNet, you can actually do that. I understand and that nebula, I, I use the same technique also here too. I understand that there's a different version of StarNet maybe coming out, uh, paid version that would have different capabilities. I don't know exactly what, maybe, maybe Rob has some information on that. Um, I think I read about it just like you. I don't know if maybe Rob has a, 
is more plugged in? No, I mean, Nicola mentioned it to me at some point, but I, I didn't really engage him on it. I mean, so I don't know. There's also on, uh, on platforms other than macOS, there's people who have recompiled the Starnet to use uh, the, the GPU as, uh, as the main processor. And uh, this uh, creates a huge speed bump. So yeah, I, I don't think it's available. That possibility is yet available on, uh, on Mac. <laughs> Probably. No. I mean, at least on a single images like this one, it's uh, maybe a couple of minutes. If you if you do a, a twenty five panel mosaic, maybe yes, and that would be a would be a chore. When I first saw your image, I thought that the processing was exquisite. So now I'm very pleased to see how you did it, and I feel like I've learned a lot. That's a lot of insight in one evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have one question. Uh, of course, the go ahead, Jay. Ah, uh, yes. Um, how does this work on galaxies? Uh, let me see if I let me think if I have anything uh, that can be used for galaxies. Maybe yes. Let me open a project. Yeah, M one oh six. I'll take a couple of minutes to open a project. I apologize. It works. Uh, the, the reason why it shouldn't work with Galaxy, because anyway, uh, Starnet handles mm -hmm. galaxies pretty well. It, se it effectively separates uh, the, the foreground stars from the galaxy, which can be, again, not, if you're imaging something, a galaxy with a supernova, for instance, it would probably consider that the supernova is not part of the galaxy, which would not be correct. But those are uh, very special cases, I would say. All right. It's uh, opening everything. Give me some, uh, some more time. I apologize, it's a big project. All right, it's coming. By the way, the image that I'm going to try to out of the project that I'm going to open is this one. And it was, uh, I, if I remember correctly, it was like uh, three hours from, uh, from a semi-dark spot. But I went to Coyote Lake for this and another four hours from home. So it was not, uh, not Pinnacles and not a super long integration either. Okay, here we are. All right, let me see in the history. Uh, this is uh, just after the arcs in H. Then I did uh, some histogram transformation. And then I did the Starnet magic, and the, this is the step in which I recombine them together. 
And let's see what the result is. Yeah. You can see here the before and after, sorry. Before, after, before and after. It's not that dramatic. As I said, the data was not as good as it was for the, the Gecko Nebula or for the Flaming Star, but still it does, uh, still it helps to be able to process separately stars and, uh, and galaxies in this case. There's still some advantage to it. Any other question? Can you click on the uh, preview so that we can uh, see? Uh, question, when you combine the two. Yep. Go ahead, Rob. Oh, uh, I was just gonna say, when you combine the starless and the star, the, the, the process stars, are you, it looked like you're just adding them together or are you sometimes using maximum operator or is there any reason to do anything different? depending on oh, the image. Yeah. Um, I just uh, add them together. Yeah, I don't do a, a maximum. You could uh, you could do the maximum, I suppose. It's um, the issue is that uh, the when you if you start with the with the stars that are superimposed uh, on a, on an on a galaxy in this case, the when you look at the the starless version, the sorry, the star field version that uh, that uh, Starnet has produced, those stars, the 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 amplitude of the peak would be depressed by the same amount that has ended up in the starless version. So if you do a max, you're actually reducing potentially reducing the the intensity of the of the stars. You probably could do a max. Uh, I don't know of the Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I, no, don't I was, see just, a good I was just curious because I've seen, I've just seen different ways of doing it, including, and it's not coming to mind, but I've seen some very complex expressions for yeah. merging them back together, which you know, not always fully understood why that well, was necessary. So Clearly, it wasn't necessary here. There's a something that I I didn't mention in the when we were looking at the gecko images that. Uh, as long as you are in the linear domain, you can always do a, I mean, when you do a subtraction or a sum, those are perfectly legitimate uh, uh, operation because you are uh, summing or subtracting essentially numbers, number of the photons of electrons in the, in the pixel wells. After the image is stretched, the, by subtracting or adding, you are no longer adding uh, linear data and so in theory those are should not be legitimate operations so it's a uh, it it works anyway in my experience but uh, one way to to be absolutely rigorous about that would be to apply the same probably exponential transformation that was applied for the stretch then do the sum and then reapply, sorry, apply it in reverse, do the sum of the subtraction and then apply it forward. But it's, um, in the end, I, I, I never saw any part, much difference. Probably uh, at the levels of brightness that we have, the stars are pretty close to the saturation point. It's not, uh, the difference is not, the, the difference uh, between a, a linear version, a locally linear version and the, the actual uh, linear, uh, original linear data is not that much. Meaning that you're using a linear approximation in a, in a small, uh, in a small portion of the histogram. And that's probably okay. But again, if uh, Konohiro would see this, he would say, no, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> Bruce, you were saying something? Oh, we lost him. Uh, 
Oh, I think he's talking about one, right? I mean, I don't know that he does any real processing anymore, right? He just codes. But I mean, he he's from an academic background, so if the yeah. image, uh, if false color image is meant to show a particular, I don't know, abundance of the chemical species compared to another one, that would be fine. What he normally uh, rails against uh, is inventing data, and in uh, in his uh, in his interpretation, inventing data is uh, anything that uh, creates a, a, non, a local change, like uh, correcting the dust mode, or something that is not applied uniformly across the image. Now, technically, the uh, StarNet is actually inventing data because uh, the neural network actually generates the image uh, from random noise. Right? It actually takes the original image and it takes the random noise, and from the random noise, creates an under image. And that's why we see the artifacts on the starless uh, nebula, right? Yep. Yeah. It actually invents another nebula, <laughs> technically, <laughs> from random noise. Yeah. So I, I don't know how much resistance uh, did you actually encounter, Rob, to to get StarNet into the standard distribution? None, none, none really. So I, none. you know, one, one seems pretty rigid sometimes, but then he's also pretty pragmatic. I think he recognized it was something useful, so. He, and everybody does. But I, I, yeah, I mean, I agree that, I mean, you guys all know about this documentary school manifesto that Juan wrote, right? I mean, years ago that caused a lot of stir and he, you know, different forum threads, he still comes back to it, exactly what Francesco's saying about inventing data or painting and all that stuff and so people get angry and you know it's, it's just his opinion i guess or whatever whatever group of astrophotographers at the time like signed on to this manifesto but well as soon as you stretch the image it's no longer science right i mean well I, it's not so much about science and as far as i can understand but it's really about like you know the, the invention of data so like like for instance what eric coles was showing like just grabbing a part of the image with the lasso and changing the colors like that was, juan's head would explode i mean you just that's that's right out right i think he he said many times that like well if you you know if you come up with some mask for the image that's derived from the luminance or that has some relationship to the image and then you apply some operation you know somewhat globally through that mask then you know that's okay but i don't think he's ever really said it's quote unquote science. I mean, you're right. The minute, the minute you stretch the image, I mean, you, you, we're all just making art, right? So yeah. and then, then it's a question of how far do you want to push it? So that's why I never really got so upset about all that stuff. Cause it's just like, it's all a matter of degree. I, I think it's, it's, uh, we don't need to worry about science now because everybody that actually posts pictures on uh, Astrobean is it's mostly for art, right? I don't yeah. expect professional astronomers to come on us to be and look for data because uh, they usually look black and white <laughs> they just need the yeah. yeah yeah i mean they're interested in other aspects of the data right not yeah. not what it looks like to the eye so yes it, my interpretation is exactly that rob it's uh, you you need it to make it appealing to the eye because at the end you want to measure it with a with an instrument which is your eye so you're trying to adapt uh, the the brightness scale to what your eye perceives, which is not linear. Sure. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Hi. Excellent. Excellent presentation. Thanks. Uh, Okay. Glenn, uh, you were going to share with us some of your recent experiences imaging Mars. Okay. Um, let's see, I've got a, I'm double control on the audio here. I have to mute and unmute in two places. So I think it's all correct now. You guys can hear me? Yes. All yep. right. Let's Love see what we can do here. Uh, OK. 
Okay, can you guys see the presentation? Yes. Okay, so this just a, a kind of a quick overview here of what I've been doing with Mars and what I've learned. I don't claim to be uh, any kind of an expert, but uh, it's certainly different it's from certainly different from, um, from deep deep sky. Deep, deep sky. So anyway, dive in here. So, you know, we're talking about bright, super bright objects compared to what we're, we're usually doing with uh, nebulae, et cetera. Uh, so they're planets uh, other than the, you know, other than the moon and, and the sun, which would also be classed as kind of planetary imaging because you use the same, some of the same techniques. Uh, they're, they're also small. And so they need a lot of magnification. Um, and in contrast, again, to taking pictures of nebulae or, or galaxy, uh, you're going to use extremely short exposures. The, the shorter, the better, because you're doing what's called lucky imaging, where you're trying to just catch an instant of good scene over your whole image or, or over part of your image, maybe. Um, and you're also going to be sort of grossly oversampling uh, with lots of magnification, which leads to a high focal ratio. Uh, and so you're using a, a Barlow versus the native resolution of your scope or using a focal reducer like many of us do for, for long exposure uh, deep space. So as I said, you know, lucky imaging. So it's lots of fast frames uh, trying to catch that moment of, of clear scene. So the faster you can go, the better. And then when you're stacking your, your lucky imaging stacking application has ways of determining which of those frames are sharply in focus and which ones aren't. And then they let you stack uh, a certain number or a certain percentage of those frames. And then um, you can use a wavelet sharpening to recover details from that oversampled and then stacked uh, image data. And there's also software that lets you derotate. So, uh, you know, if you're taking a video long enough of the planet, uh, you know, it this, the surface features will move as the planet rotates during the time that you're taking the video. So there's actually software that can help deal with that as well. So there's some sort of really high level rules of thumb uh, to help you get started. And one of them has to do with the focal ratio uh, that you want to use. And so it's scene dependent, but uh, just as a, as a rule of thumb, you know, you take your pixel size in microns and you multiply it by three or four for average amateur scene. And that number that you, sort of a dimensionless number that you come up with, then is the actual focal ratio that you want to want to shoot at. So, for instance, I'm shooting with the ASI 174. It has a 5.86 micron pixel size. So, you know, three to four times that I'm going to be shooting between f18 and f24. Uh, reminds me of the the uh, Nickel telescope at at Lick uh, is you know a Cassegrain scope and they can image in a couple different configurations and there's a third configuration where the light um, actually goes you know through the scope three times and then goes down the bottom and down the hall you know to a basement room somewhere at f39 and that's how they they use that configuration for uh, for planetary um, and so you you arrive at that higher focal ratio not by reducing your your aperture although that that would be valid other than you know a loss of detail to increase the focal ratio but um, you use what's called a barlow so it's sort of a backwards focal reducer so it's a positive lens uh, out there beyond your your focuser between the focuser and the camera and that can give you uh, magnification and they come in you know two three four x 
uh, and some of them are, are adjustable. And as I said, it's it's all about the the frame rate. So you want to look for a camera that can deliver the fastest frame rate, uh, and it, that also has to do with the you know you use just a fraction of the sensor area, or it's called a region of of interest. Um, so this ASI 174, if you just look at the the ZWO cameras, it's the one that has the fastest uh, frame rate, and uh, Bruce and I have been achieving around 150, 156 frames per second when we're using a small region of interest with that that camera. And then uh, another rule of thumb, you know, I talked for a second about the the D rotation. Um, if you don't want to go through that step, you just need to limit the the time frame that you capture your data over. So someone's posted here uh, some rules of thumbs for the different planets based on their rate of rotation. Now this has some effect of where they are in, in their orbit in relation to, to Earth. Uh, but th so these, again, general rules of thumb. So for Mars, you know, if you're gonna be taking uh, videos per filter or you know, maybe five of any one filter or what what have you. You know, each of those videos should not be longer than than five minutes. And the whole time that you spend taking those multiple videos should not be more than than 15 minutes. And then they have Jupiter apparently moves much faster in terms of the the features. Uh, and then Saturn is somewhat in in between there. So those are some some rules of thumb. Okay, uh, you're going to be using, you know, instead of Nina or SharpCat, I mean, Nina or Voyager or SGP or um, I don't know if, uh, I'm sure Hi will chime in here, if uh, uh, K-STARS does, does planetary or not, but um, rather than using those deep space long exposure programs, you're going to be using something like SharpCap or, or Fire Capture. And I actually ended up using using both uh, for different features that they had. And then, uh, don't so, think so. Uh, go ahead. By the, no, I'm just saying I don't think so. Okay. Uh, for stacking, the the popular one these days is uh, Auto Stacker. It's free. And then one that used to be popular for stacking and now is just used for some uh, later processing st steps is Registax, which is also free. Uh, and that's used mainly for the wavelet sharpening. And then in the particular workflow I found that, that I used, uh, they also use it for aligning the, the RGB and for balancing the, the RGB. And then if you need to derotate, there's a program called WinJupos uh, that can derotate. And I, I don't understand exactly, you know, how it, is it like inventing the data as the features <laughs> come around the corner or, or what? But uh, it somehow it, it does it. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, and then there's a PIPP, which can do you know, overlaps with some of these, and some people use it just as a as a preprocessor. They run the videos through that and do some operations first uh, before they go into the into the stacking, and then uh, Photoshop or what have you for for doing some graphics type stuff. Uh, the particular workflow for Mars that I came across, uh, he uses a synthetic green channel rather than taking green data. Although it looks like he does take green data for Jupiter and, and Saturn, but not for Mars. Um, and then Photoshop for, for final tweaks. So that's kind of an overview of the, the software. So I stumbled on this London astronomer guy. That's the name of his website. And you can see uh, his work there on the right, not too shabby. Uh, pretty amazing stuff. And uh, in fact, even his daughter was one of the winners of the Young Astrophotographer of the Year Award this year with uh, something she did uh, on the sun, I believe. Um, so that's a, that's a good uh, 
family of people to, to follow. So he has uh, a general overview of planetary imaging, which is, you know, super more in depth than I'm not, I'm not even really going to go into it here because um, you can just go read it. Uh, and then he has specifics on Mars and the moon. And I, I noticed today it looks like he's added one for Venus as well. So, um, you know, you can pick your expert, but this is one one expert uh, that has a pretty detailed and step-by-step -step instructions on the whole workflow of image capturing and processing. Okay, so um, just kind of quickly here, you can see some of the different images that I came up with over about a, a week or two, maybe two weeks of goofing around with this. Uh, and we'll go more into my my process or my journey uh, you know it involved lots of 3d printing of, of mounting pieces and adapter pieces uh, you know as prototypes ideally you'd replace them with with metal at some point but and uh, lots of or not lots of two different uh, Arduinos uh, for doing I, I made a focuser for the the club one of the clubs Mac CAS uh, and I made uh, uh, automation for the flip mirror so that I could operate the flip mirror from in the house where I normally operate the, the telescope. Um, and, you know, I went through two different cameras. I had uh, a, a camera that I actually won at uh, as a door prize at the last uh, AIC. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I feel like I got what I paid for because <laughs> it really hasn't done anything it, it just it doesn't work very well for me so i switched to the it, it's a one shot color was why i was trying to use it uh, but i switched to a filter wheel and the asi 174 and then uh, i did end up uh you know i started on my 12 inch rc and then i went to the the mac cas uh you know the even though the aperture is so much smaller the mac cas is supposed to be a good optical design for planetary uh, but then I ended up uh, with Bruce's encouragement going back to the to my 12 inch RC and cranking up the magnification either either further. And uh, I spent lots of time, uh, you know, coming to focus. And maybe I overcomplicated things by including this flip mirror. So, you know, you need you need some way of getting on the the target. You know, Mars is a super small target, and when you're using just a fraction of of a sensor and blowing it way up, you know, the, the sky is huge, and you're kind of wandering all over the place trying to find this this planet. So the idea of the flip mirror was to have, uh, you know, the Barlow on one leg and the planetary camera on one leg of the of the the straight through leg of the flip mirror, and then you flip the mirror down and put a bigger sensor with no Barlow, so like an ASI 1600 or something. So if you get it centered on that, and then you flip the mirror, and hopefully you're somewhere close on the, on, on the other one. Um, that sort of kind of sometimes worked, which I'll, I'll talk about, but, um, but that added a lot of more of, you know, trying to make the two cameras par focal and trying to, you know, have all the different extensions and to make it all, to make it all happen. Um, I guess I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. And, and one of my learnings was, you know, even if I, I got everything in focus during the daytime on the farthest terrestrial object that I, that I have, which is trees that are, you know, at least two, three blocks away, uh, then turns out at night for stars and planets, uh, that's, I, I was still not within the range of my, my moonlight focuser. So I had to, you know, take things apart and, and add uh, or remove extensions again to come to focus. So there was lots of daytime and nighttime coming to focus uh, stuff. So yeah, and lots of practice, uh, lots of learning, getting on the target, as I mentioned, getting in focused, and the whole concept of, you know, this completely different software tools for both for image capture and for processing. So you can see here some of the different images that I, that I came up with. And I guess out of those, I kind of picked this one. You guys can tell me what, what you think you like the best. But I think some of these, I went overboard on the on the sharpening 
Uh, and I, I like these ones that look, you can really tell that it's a globe and it's got the little shine on it there, like, you know, the sun reflecting off a globe versus kind of a flat, uh, even though it might have more detail. Um, and then, you know, the last night, this was, you might think this one was the first night, but it's actually <laughs> the last night. And I guess the scene was just really crap, but uh, that's what happened on the last night. So, um, okay, keyboard focus here, sorry. So one of the things that was mentioned in this London astronomer uh, workflow was um, to use an IR filter instead of uh, a luminance filter. And I happened to have this IR pass filter because I was using it for, for years uh, to image, or not to image, but to guide through, uh, you know, sort of in anticipating uh, uh, of using an ONAG, which has a, a cold mirror that you're guiding in the, in the IR, because, you know, I heard Gaston talking about how uh, uh, it's easier to, to guide lower on the horizon with, through the, in the infrared. So that's why I had that filter. But the filter was inch and a quarter, and the filter wheel I had available to use was 36 millimeters, so I had to 3D print. You can see this little white plastic here. I had to 3D print an adapter for that. So that was one of the many 3D printed pieces uh, that happened. And then um, the Club Mac CAS, uh, you know, is the typical like an SCT or a Mac CAS. There's just a uh, let's see, my didn't change, did it? Uh, okay, what's going on here? Can you guys still hear me even? It seems everything went quiet and my thing stopped working. I, I can hear you. Okay, all right. I can uh, hear you. Roll. <laughs> all right. I was uh, thinking I was all by myself there for a minute. Let's see if we can get back into this here. Sorry. Uh, I'm still presenting, so why am I not seeing this then? Well, I can stop presenting and then restart a window, PowerPoint, share. Is it PowerPoint that messed up? Can you see that? I, we can see, I can see it. Okay, thank you. We see your PowerPoint, but we also see the, the uh, bar on the side with all the slides, it's not maximized. It's kind of in editing mode, I guess. That's weird. Was it always been like that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, all right. That's weird because on my recording here, I'm just getting the, the presentation. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, anyway, let me move forward. Um, so I was talking about the, you know, like an SCT, the Mac CAS just has a little knob here for that's covered in this picture uh, by this device I made to uh, hold a, a inexpensive motor to m motorize the, the focuser. Um, so we did that. And then uh, this whole bunch of junk here is, is uh, automating the, the flip mirror. So it's actually the same, same motor and, and uh, driver board and another Arduino that, that is uh, turning the knob on the flip mirror. And then in all on this, I think there were, I counted 13 different 3D printed parts uh, at this point of the, the prototyping and stuff. So there's quite a lot of 3D printing going on. Um, so yeah, the final uh, Matt Kaz rig that, that I started with, um, and I did have a, a green laser pointer to help with the finding, getting on target, 
and being very careful between planes flying over every 10 minutes to make sure that the laser pointer was never on when a pilot might see it and freak out. So, um, but that at one point I was setting this up on a on a tripod, not even a a, a mount, just a a ball head kind of thing, um, just to do some testing and get things par focal. And that's when I really needed the the laser pointer. Um, and this, I don't know if this is going to show if you guys aren't seeing the, can you see that moving? Yes. Okay. So this is just showing the, the flip mirror moving there. If you look, uh, right there, you can see the knob turning back and forth. So that was convenient to be able to operate that from, from in the house. And this is before, this is, see, there's that ATEC uh, GP on the imaging end, and I had the ASI-174 on the, on the flip mirror side of things, the mirror side of things. But I, after this, I switched, switched cameras. So just to give you an idea, I mentioned those trees that were down the street, right? So the difference in, in magnification, um, so this is the the ASI 1600 native resolution on the 12 inch RC, and then when we use the the final position of the Barlow uh, on the right hand side, there you can see the amount of magnification that that we had. Um, and again, you know, I did this all during the day, and I thought I was all set up, and then at night I could not achieve focus on the uh, stars, so. I had to uh, adjust the amount of extensions and whatnot again because the throw on my focuser wasn't far enough to to uh, focus on the planets and stars. I'm still waiting on extension tubes to to get further out. I was yeah. close. For yeah. So this is the. There's a lot fewer pieces of plastic in here now that I've replaced some of them with with metal as things have have shipped uh, but you can see um, just on the back end of the flip mirror which is the square cube here is the barlow and this is an astrophysics barlow that's somewhat adjustable by a, like a focal reducer by adjusting the amount of space between um, it and the and the uh, camera and now I'm confused again because I have something different on. Are you seeing the uh, slide? We see, which, sorry, we see the, uh, the the your stuff on a tabletop. Okay, good. For some reason, I don't see that on on the presentation side, but I'll just keep going forward here. Um, do you see the mouse moving here? Yes. Okay. All right. I'll just focus on this screen. Boy, this Google uh, Meet seems problematic tonight for some reason. Yeah. yeah. I left the company like six months ago. They just, <laughs> yeah, just went to hell. Yeah. OK, so yeah, so adjusting this, these spacers here would, would adjust the amount of magnification. Uh, and then you could add or remove spacers here between the flip mirror and the focuser to come to focus. Um, but like a focal reducer when you change this the focal plane shifts and um, it's supposed to shift out as you increase magnification as a focal reducer would shift in as you increase focal reduction but i think that it shifted out less fast than the amount of extension I was adding to get it to to mag up so it actually kind of went in so that was very confusing and and uh, a lot of head scratching but you know I just had to keep playing with it until I came came to focus um, but yeah so you, that's always a challenge with a new optical rig is getting it to come to focus okay so Maybe. Have you come up with a, a way, like an easy way of telling exactly what your magnification is? Uh, it would be hard to plate solve with such a f small field of view. So, um, 
Yeah, I remember struggling with that, and then I thought that I solved it, but it's not coming to mind right at the moment. Um, yeah, I'll have to I'll have to get back to you on that because I did I did figure it out at one point exactly, but now I've, it, it escapes me right at the moment. To um, measure the diameter of the planet in pixels. Oh, that's what it was. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, the apparent size of Mars. Yes. Thank you. So the apparent size of Mars is published both in uh, Stellarium, for instance, and um, also it's been in articles because of Mars being at opposition. Uh, so, yeah. And then if I find the right piece of paper, you know, post-it note on my desk here somewhere, it's going to say, um, but from memory, it was, you know, it was something like 26 arc seconds or something. I don't know. Anyway, that's, that's how it, that's how it worked out. So yeah, I've, I was able to figure out exactly what it was. Um, but I didn't put that in the presentation. So some, some lessons that I learned along the way, uh, plan for plenty of time just to find Mars and get it on your sensor. <laughs> that can take, uh, you know, the first time you do it, it might take you like an hour or more just to just to do that simple little thing. Um, you know, I think uh, the guy that spoke at, at AIC, you know, he does it with a flip mirror and, a, and a, uh, an eyepiece with a reticle in it. Um, but, you know, I'm never out at the scope, I'm, I'm in the house, so it's problematic to do that way, but um, that might be a, a good way to do it. Um, so yeah, plan on lots of time for that. And then, you know, go ahead and maybe you, you only want to image when you're up at the meridian, but uh, go ahead and, and get on target early in the evening when it's low in the sky, and that'll give you time to make sure that you can get on the target and then you have time to practice with focusing and working with the image capture software before you get to the point where you actually want to take your data for that you're going to keep um, and I, as i mentioned the flip mirror was a, was good in concept but uh, i had you know some some sag due to some of the maybe due to some of the plastic parts or just too many extensions or whatnot so it, it really wasn't as effective as I thought it should be because, you know, basically I shot laser through there and, uh, you know, it's not, the, the laser's not coming to the, the center in both arms of the, the focal reducer, or even if you, you know, shoot a laser down the optical path of the scope, it's not even centered on the, on the sensor. So lots of, uh, lots of sag issues. So, uh, went about replacing all the prototyped plastic parts with with metal and uh, you know try to just the normal stuff you try to replace compression fittings with threaded fittings uh, and stiffen things up and then hopefully it'll it'll line up better um, and you know once I got things uh, you know, stiff and rigid and and dialed in, then I pretty much could go directly from, I was using a, a small refractor uh, mounted on the top of my RC uh, to, you know, I would plate solve onto Mars and then go on to the, directly to the planetary camera uh, and do a spiral search and find it. And I, so I didn't, in the end, I wasn't really using the, the flip mirror at all. Um, so I did find that, speaking of spiral search, I did find that the spiral search in EQMod is pretty horrible if you look at it on a small scale, like around a planet like Mars. Uh, it was very jerky and, and uncontrolled, and I found that uh, the one in SharpCap worked much better, and I, I set it at, at 16x, and that seemed to be a good compromise between, whoops, there it went, and, you know, taking forever. Um, one thing that I did struggle with, and maybe reading the manual or something would, would help, but as soon as I let off the button in sharp cap, that spiral search button, uh, the, the scope would stop tracking. So I had to, like, as soon as I let off the button, then I had to quickly go to EQMod and press um, sidereal tracking rate so that it didn't, 
you know, fly out of the frame the other direction to the west. So, um, and I didn't see, uh, you know, I ended up using fire capture for the actual image capturing, but I didn't see anything like a spiral search. I only saw guiding controls in fire capture for mounts. So I ended up using sharp cap in the beginning of the night to get on Mars and then switching to fire capture to actually take the data. Um, another thing I learned was that, you know, at this magnification, you're really going to feel all of the different backlashes in your mechanical components. You know, you really, the focuser, you know, even, you know, moonlight should be a pretty good focuser, right? But you can, you can <laughs> see the, the effects of the backlash, both in, in moving the mount and in moving the focuser and everything's just very, uh, hair hair trigger. Um, I think your time would be well spent uh, learning the different controls in these capture programs to control the region of interest on your sensor that you're going to be imaging and uh, really understand how that how that works. In the beginning I was just trying to kind of hand jam everything and assuming that it was the ROI was always in the center. And then I learned it was actually moving up into the upper left hand corner. And then I learned you could move it around, which was way better. And, you know, uh, one of the, the last things that, that happened was I noticed that once I'm pointed right up at the, uh, at the meridian, so almost, almost straight up, um, then stuff would be falling onto this on into the optical path somewhere you know this is some ash or something from the from the fires and so i'd be imaging and then suddenly there'd be this big dust moat uh on top of mars and so i'd have to move the mount ever so slightly and move the roi back on top of mars um, so understanding how all those controls worked was was important um, and you know, you want to maximize the, the frame rate, uh, but you also don't want your gain to be too high because that adds grain and noise. So I settled on a, a you know, I was maximizing the, the frame rate by uh, reducing the region of interest and reducing the exposure. And then after a certain point, the frame rate doesn't get any faster, even if you make the ROI smaller or you make the exposure uh, faster. So figure out where those edges are and put it at the at the maximum uh, exposure for the ROI that you're going to use and then set the gain at that point and uh, for a good histogram. And you, you do that on a per filter basis if you're shooting through filters. And fire capture seems to remember those those settings uh, for exposure and all. So when you then go and do a, a sequence of filters, it, it does the right thing. Uh, and I learned that, uh, you know, the 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 uh, advice from from this uh, London astronomer that I chose to use as my my expert source, uh, he said, you know, well, I stack 50% of my uh, my frames, and I'm thinking, well, you know, if 50% is is good, then wouldn't 1% or 10% be even sharper? Uh, but what I found out was that, y yes, 1% uh, or 10% of the frame is are higher quality, but then you can't apply as much sharpening. So if with, with more depth to your stack, then they tolerate the stack. It, it tolerates more sharpening before you get artifacts. Um, but uh, just because you can sharpen something more without artifacts, as, as I showed you in those uh, that uh, those thumbnails, uh, doesn't mean that you should, <laughs> right? So you you should sharpen uh, so that it looks natural and not not it's easy to it's easy to overdo. And I also had a problem with uh, you know I figured out how to how to batch process in, in Registax uh, the wavelet sharpening. And uh, I would pick uh, some settings that look good on a certain filter. And uh, 
then apply it as a batch to all of them and in some cases it was it was too much and it was easy to it was easy to overdo so i guess it's um which leads to the to the last learning there so uh processing you know it takes a lot of time and a lot of patience and uh there seems to be a not much automation so it's a very manual process at least to my understanding so far Okay, questions. <laughs> Any questions? So in the on the mailing list you had you had, had some initial images and there was like some kind of weird almost Bayer or screen door effect. It, was that with the OSC or is was that some other problem that you worked out? Um I honestly don't recall right at the moment. Um it was a pretty intense couple. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. Couple weeks, though, um, and I, you know, obviously, I should go back now and reprocess everything to see what what I uh, can come up with now. But I, you know, I, I on uh, I think it's been maybe two, three nights back. You know, I said, okay, I'm done with this planetary stuff. What's up in the sky? And I put my my uh, 80 millimeter refractor on the Sol Nebula and the hydrogen alpha. The first sub that came through was just like, you know, tack sharp. And I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> I'm back where I belong. You know, okay. so so yeah. But uh, and is is that in the upper? Uh, left-hand corner there that's the un, sort of the unprocessed unsharpened stack well, actually no that's that's why i was saying uh uh that's actually the last night uh, that i did planetary oh, okay. yeah the scene was was just crap i guess i see i see yeah yeah um that's after registax wavelet yeah sharpening. yeah mm -hmm. that's was processed all the way through yeah uh -huh. yeah um, i wanted to ask you if you if you've found any tutorials on, I guess there's probably a manual someplace for Registax for using the wavelets uh, part for going through the different size scales and figuring out how to optimize your image using that. Yeah, I saw some posts, people hinting about having seen stuff. Uh, what I was doing was you know, starting at the bottom and working my way up on the on the Gaussian uh, setting and never going like if if the bottom one was five, then the next one would be four and then three and then two and then one. Right. So I never and maybe there's no, you know, mathematical reason why that would be. But that seemed to be the way to avoid artifacts. But I definitely saw some posts about people talking about using the noise reduction part of the Gaussian tool uh, and making kind of a, the guy said it made a V shape or something. I didn't really get, but um, so it, I think it it uh, needs more looking into. But uh, the London astronomer, as you probably know, Bruce, because I think he read through all that stuff too, doesn't didn't mention any any that level of detail um right i've seen a couple of videos from others also that lost over it so i was mm -hmm. wondering yeah um, okay okay so i don't know yeah. how to, i can uh if i could figure out how to get rid of this uh presentation screen over the top of my video so are, you, are you coming back to deep sky <laughs> am i coming back to deep sky yeah yeah okay welcome back <laughs> and show okay there we go stop presenting there we go okay well that was excellent Give us all a good uh, a good start anyway, and I'm glad to know that I'm not the only one having difficulty finding focus. So <laughs> I, I went I started out using an Edge 11 
and was able to, you know, I was able to do it at native resolution, no problem. Uh, but uh, using the 3X, uh, I eventually was able to come to focus with the uh, Explore Scientific 3X uh, expand, expander, a uh, tele expander, it's called, which is similar to a PowerMate. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know, I don't know if it was the spacing between that and the back of the edge or that and the image plane, uh, the focal plane of the camera, but it, the image didn't look as clear as it should be considering what the seeing looked like that night. So I, I, I wasn't uh, feeling it and I uh, decided to go to using my stellar view and uh, found that I was not able to come to focus with the extensions that I have on the back of the mm. stellar views. I'm waiting on that. And uh, yeah, I'm well, I, the shot. I think, you know, the technique is um, you defocus it one way or the other until it's obviously like, oh, it's obviously getting worse. And then you take note of that and then you go the other direction until it's obviously getting worse and then you split the difference and I think and then you just wait for the for the uh, you know the scene to to oscillate around that point and you uh, pray for the lucky imaging to to pull something out uh, you know I think trying to zero in any tighter than that um, is just not going to get you anywhere at least with the scene that I had. Um, so Plus, yeah, very wide. Uh, CFC. F20 yeah. or F29, whatever you're shooting. Yeah, you should have a, a wide uh, critical focus zone. Although you would mm -hmm. swear, you know, you could sit there and and there's, you know, focusing aids in, in sharp cap anyway. Um, you know, you could swear that you were making progress, and then I'd always press the button one more time, and then it would just be horrible. You know, it's like it's getting better, it's getting better, it's getting better. Oh, and then you got the backlash, and it's uh, I never could could zero in on it any better. So, but you know, using that other technique I talk about was was what I used on the last night, which had the horrible results. So, I don't know. You guys can. Uh, can uh, try it and and help educate us all. Um, okay. Well, Mars still should be pretty good for the next couple of weeks, I guess. So hopefully, uh, I'll be able to nail it. Um, anybody have any questions? Well, I just have an option. Uh, I think that you might find. Uh, the best time to take pictures of Mars in the next couple of months will be in what you would call deep twilight, just from a visual observer point of view where I come from. It's in this, this time of the year, uh, that is often when you will find the best scene for that sort of observation. So, uh, in other words, by the time it gets to the meridian, it may be too late as far as the scene goes. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, My, atmospheric yeah. dispersion was another challenge that I didn't put in the uh, in the presentation, uh, and I actually yeah. ordered a, a atmospheric dispersion corrector, but it still hasn't arrived, and I ordered it months ago, so. I think you and hundreds of other people have, yeah. including, have ordered that, and it hasn't turned right. Yeah. They have like a 30 day uh, out at this time, I believe. Hmm. But I'm sure you'll get yours very soon. You ordered Yeah, so I, I tried to, to image above uh, 50 degrees in any case. Um, hmm. But yeah, I'd be interested, PJ, in your, uh, you know. He, PJ, yeah, is that due to yeah. your uh, your elevation and being in the Sierras and, and the way that the seeing seems to deteriorate later in the night or oh no I'm talking about the uh, Bay Area what happens is is that um, during the day the Central Valley warms up the air expands the pressure goes down it sucks in air from the bay from the ocean mm -hmm. and then early in the evening, 
that's the big suck stopped when the when the pressures equalized between the, the Central Valley and the Bay Area. When that happened, then uh, the separation of layers from the marine layer to above it will go still for a while. And that's when you can hit the best scene. I have on occasion used 1100 power from my backyard in San Jose to look at the moon and seeing all the little craters in Plato, for instance, in those kind of conditions. Also, the um, deep twilight will help with the atmospheric uh, dispersion issue because it will sort of wipe it out. So you don't have to worry about it too much. So as Mars progresses and gets up above about 30 degrees at that time of the, of the uh, night, I think you might have some good luck with that. Yeah, um, the, the, um, I'm going to forget his name now, but one of the uh, video bloggers uh, from Australia was talking about doing planetary during the day. Um, but it probably has... Yeah, uh, yeah, to do with uh, being in the southern hemisphere for for Mars, I guess. But it was interesting. Um, one thing I wanted to add, I had to ask you, and I don't think we really followed through on figuring it out. Uh, maybe you knew, but we did. We, the direction of the conversation went a different way. But uh, if you're using an ABC and you're using a one shot color camera, you can you can just see it do its correction. But I was wondering how you would do it if you're using a monochrome. Oh, fuck it, you don't need it. Yeah, films. And that there's a, well, uh, they, they specifically said there's a filter that actually puts flare on the edge of the planet. So when you are when you get the colors aligned, it basically centers it. Um, if you're not using that filter, you don't see it according to what I was reading. Well, uh, I, was, I, I, I was assuming that, I was hoping that there would be something that you know the 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 red filter and the especially the infrared the infrared filter seemed to have pretty crisp edges and the red almost as crisp but the blue had you know flares to the upper left and the and the lower right uh always and you could see it as it goes in and out of focus there's always this limb of fuzziness and i was hoping that some optical component would make that be more like the IR and the and the red filter, but it's really hard to get the the it's really hard to get any kind of data out of the out of the blue filter. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, blue uh, will actually scatter light in the atmosphere when you're looking at something like Mars. And so when it comes to an edge, you're getting forward scatter from the actual atoms in the atmosphere at that point. So it's kind of hard to avoid. Okay. That's why the infrared works very well. Yeah. Glenn, are you using the IR and combining it as if it were a luminance or how are you? Yeah. Put it together? Instead right. of luminance. And there's one line in, in the guy's uh london astronomer i'm sorry i'm really bad with name roger roger hutchison and he he just has sort of this parenthetical statement about now there's some you know argument in the forums about whether or not you should use ir for luminance but but i use it so you know i figured look at his results so that's that's what i went with since i had one and it definitely did was the best looking of mm -hmm. all the filters even i did do one night where i took green as well um but yeah the the uh versus the synthetic green but uh, the ir was always the best looking image okay. anybody have any uh, further questions or additions Okay. Well, um, I guess this brings our meeting to a close. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Glenn and Francesco, for great presentations. Um, You're welcome. If anybody has any ideas for next month?
I'm open to suggestions. We don't have anything lined up right now. I'm working on it though. So I guess I'll see you uh, sometime soon online, probably the way things are right now. Take care. Yeah, thank you all. It was very enjoyable. Thanks for coming. Thanks. All right, so much. thank you. Bye. Bye.